It's uh, wonderful to be here with Dan and Fern Ronson's Valley, our dear friend for uh, Valley for many years, Ronson's Valley for many years. I think they did one of the best jobs of constructing a church building and decorating. And I mean, you talk about color coordination. <clears throat> this building is absolutely fabulous. God bless their ministry in a great way. You might be interested to know that he came to the Assemblies of God through the Church of God. He was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in Church of God altars and has done a great job from the Lord. So we claim partial credit for Dan and Fern Ronson's Valley success as top-notch Assembly of God pastors. Don't we claim them? This is uh, coming up on a holiday weekend, Father's Day, special date. Just want to remind everybody of that. I uh, have the privilege of being invited to the Adamsville Church, Brother Steve Wesson. I'm not a selfish man. I'll be happy with half as much as they gave to Lee College this coming Sunday. <coughs> not greedy at all. <laughs> Somebody think the smelling salts back to Steve over there, will you? Think you just passed out? <laughs> I booked it before I heard about the Lee College weekend. I want you to know that. And uh, Father's Day weekend is special. Don't be now like the married couple where he was non-communicative in the morning, drank his coffee and read the paper, didn't say anything. One morning his wife came to the table and said, sweetheart, do you know what date this is? He didn't answer. A few minutes passed, she poured another cup of coffee and said, say, uh, do you happen to know what day this is? He didn't respond. A few minutes passed and she poured him another cup of coffee and rattled the paper on the other side and said, say, do you know what day this is? And he slammed the paper down uncharacteristically, touchily, and said, of course I know what day this is. You think I'm some sort of a fool? And he stalked out, went to work, slammed the door behind him. At about 10 o'clock that morning, a florist delivered a dozen long stem red roses. At one that afternoon, another uh, courier brought a five pound box of Godiva chocolates. At about four that afternoon, another courier brought some beautiful negligee, and at 6.30, he showed up for dinner, candles were burning, and she came to the door and hugged him and kissed him and said, sweetheart, thank you so much. You've made this the most unforgettable Groundhog's Day of our lives. Thank you. I want you all to know what day this coming Sunday was. In case he says, sweetheart, do you know what day this is? You'll know what day it is. It's Father's Day. I speak tonight from a subject that I personally would not have selected for this night of camp meeting. Every preacher here can empathize with what I'm saying because you have certain <clears throat> material that you're familiar with, that you've worked with through the years, you know will work, so to speak. It's kind of like Moses when the Lord said, speak to the rock. God asked him to operate out of his weakness, speech, he had a speech impediment. His strength was the rod. He, instead operating out of his weakness, he operated out of his strength. He smote the rock and it worked all right. But he was penalized because of his disobedience and not allowed to go into the promised land. And when it all said and done, when we all get to the judgment of rewards at the Bema, we'll be rewarded for our faithfulness and for our obedience to God, not for using something we think might work because it's worked in the past. And I <clears throat> willingly submit my will to God's will for this service tonight, and I do not intend to preach a very long sermon. I always enjoy saying that because the most pleasant expression comes across people's faces when I say I don't intend to preach a long sermon. But I don't ever intend to preach a long sermon. It just doesn't work out that way all the time. <clears throat> but tonight I want to speak on the subject, Giants Within. Giants Within. Mary Rubenstein wanted to be a singer. She had a good voice. But she was terrified 
to sing in public. When she went into recording studios, she could do great. But in front of a live audience, she choked up. There were giants lurking in the shadows, giants of fear. And Mayor Rubenstein almost despaired until finally she got a, an invitation to sing publicly in New Jersey. And she sang, or at least tried to sing, and went weeping off the stage after the second chorus, bursting into tears and vowing never to sing again. But Ray, Mary Rubenstein somehow was able to combat the giants of fear that lurked in the shadows of her own mind and heart and finally landed a recording contract and her confidence grew. And just a few weeks ago, Mary Rubenstein, whose name has been changed since then, sold out in 21 cities around the world. Her name now is Barbara Streisand. But Ray, Ru Mary Rubenstein had to conquer the giants that were within her. In almost every stage and every age of a person's life, there are giants that we must combat. For the next few minutes, I want to help identify some giants within. We're going to identify them. Then we're going to bash them. Then we're going to smash them. We're going to kill them. Because God wants you and me at our best to reap the harvest in these last days. And when I think of giants within, I have to go back to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. And read for you from the Word of God, from this obscure text in the Old Testament. Verse 25 of Numbers 13. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the, Israel, the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in that land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, No, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the, the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. As history will bear out, <clears throat> the sons of Anak did not regard them as grasshoppers. In fact, the report had preceded them of their reputation, how they had conquered every foe. The sons of Anak and the Amalekites already had heard that the presence of the living God was with them by pillars in the daytime, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And though they had not been gone from the land of Egypt for very long, they had already heard how God had opened up the Red Sea and they marched across the Red Sea as if they were upon dry land. And I never say that until I pause and tell one of the funniest little stories that has been told so many times it's threadbare I guess uh, about this lady this was her favorite story from all the Bible and about the crossing of the Red Sea and the first year seminarian came back and said what are you rejoicing about don't you know that the Red Sea that I learned in seminary this year was only two or three inches deep it was low tide at that particular time of the year and the Red Sea was only two or three inches deep that was no uh, two or three inches deep that was no miracle for the children of uh, God to walk across as if it were dry land and she thought for a moment and started rejoicing again he said, what you shouting about now? She said, I'm shouting because my God is able to drown a whole army of Egyptian soldiers in only two or three inches of water. <laughs> 
those stories had preceded them. They had already heard about them. But sometimes when we think something ourselves, about ourselves, we naturally assume that other people think the same thing. We naturally think because we feel ourselves to be inferior or not quite up to the task that everybody else feels that same way about us. Just because we think ourselves inarticulate that others may feel that we're inarticulate or because we feel that we're not talented, others will think that we're not talented. Giants lurk on the inside of almost every person. From their smallest beginnings, their youngest years, until the day they die, giants sometimes lurk in the shadows. My grandmother loved to make a garden and to work it. It was hard to do in the ghettos of Columbus, Ohio. She had done that in her home in Harlan County, Kentucky, on the country, and that wasn't too hard to do. But in the ghettos of Columbus, Ohio, she still liked to make a garden and work it. And my favorite part was not digging the furrows with a hoe or a pick or a shovel, but my favorite part was when we were through and the seeds were planted when she made a scarecrow. She stuck one broomstick one way and horizontally the other way, dressed the scarecrow in, in uh, tattered-looking clothing and some chunks of coal where the broom was up uh, side down and, and uh, where, where it would uh, outline the face of, a, of an individual and then put an old hat on it and a corn cob pipe in it and, and it was a pretty awesome eerie sight especially about nightfall for us kids but it served its purpose it scared the crows without harming it Webster has a, a definition uh, about that he said that um, a scarecrow is a figure of a man dressed in old clothes set in the field to scare away birds from the crops. Something that frightens without harming. Did you hear that last part? Something that frightens without harming. Sometimes the devil sets up straw men in your life. Something designed to frighten you, but something that cannot harm you. Now, though these leaders of Israel <clears throat> were elected from each of the 12 tribes. They were not appointed. They were elected. Representatives of each of the 12 tribes. Quick, can anybody tell me any of the names of the 10 spies that brought back a negative report? Nobody can probably tell me a single one without looking back at the first of the chapter. But everybody here can tell me the names of the two spies that brought back the positive report. I sometimes think about the power of a negative report. You can be in an old-fashioned Holy Ghost landslide revival and somebody will find fault with the singing or the music or something's too loud or something's not loud enough or or it's too hot or it's too cold or the services are too long or the preacher preaches too long or he doesn't preach long enough although you don't hear that one too often but uh, a lot of times God can just be coming down in mighty waves of glory and somebody will think themselves as God's one man committee to set the rest of us straight I can't stand to be around holy samikis whose halos fit too tight People whose halos fit too tight give themselves and the rest of us an awfully bad headache. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying tonight is when God is moving, let him be God. Let him do his sovereign work. Some people, think they've, uh, some people think they've discovered a tenth spiritual gift, the gift of finding fault. There is no tenth spiritual gift, although some people put themselves up as God's one-man committee to keep the rest of us straight. Brothers and sisters, God doesn't need our help to keep us straight. He keeps us straight himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here they are, elected members of the tribes going into the land of promise, the land of Canaan, for 40 days to spy out the land, to see what they would see. And they came back with a positive report. Yes, it is a land of unspeakable uh, lushness and fertility. Yes, God has sent us to, symbolically speaking, a land that flows with milk and honey. Here's the proof of the fruit from that land, they showed the crowd. And uh, the 10 leaders that brought back the negative report said, but we are not able to do it. We are not able to possess the land because the walls are, the cities are walled up to heaven. And uh, the people are greater than we are. And they're stronger than we are. And we saw the sons of, a of Anak there, the giants, which spring from the generation of giants. And we are not able to do it. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and in their sight. They may have been grasshoppers in their own sight, 
but they were giants in the eyes of the people of, uh, of the, uh, the sons of Anak. They themselves, some of them were about seven and a half to eight foot tall, Flavius Josephus says. But as a matter of fact, they were terrified of the children of Israel. They were poised for a final strike of victory. Generations earlier or later, they would rue the day that they did not strike while the iron was hot. They were well able to possess the land. God was with them. God had said they were. Caleb and Joshua said, yes, we're well able to do it. Let's do it now. But the people got all up in arms and started murmuring. Murmuring against the Lord. Over in Psalm 78, he said they went in their tents and there the Lord heard them as they murmured against the Lord. Now murmuring is not just a little uh, sidebar. Murmuring is a sin in the sight of God. Whining, complaining, fault finding, gossiping is a sin. Some people said, bless God, where are the preachers that won't name sin anymore? I name all the sins that are in the Bible. I'm not afraid to name any sin that's in the Word of God. And gossip is a sin. Doubt is a sin. Unbelief is a sin. Murmuring is a sin. And you're not just murmuring against the preacher or murmuring against the denomination or murmuring against the times. But God said, you are murmuring against me. When we doubt God is able to perform what he said he would do, then we're murmuring against him. Now, there were several reasons why they did not go up and possess the land. The first and most, most notable giant that they faced was the fear of people. The fear of people, of course, is not new. Everybody has his giants. Jacob has his Esau. Daniel has his lions. The three Hebrew children, their fiery furnace. Noah, his flood. Elijah, his nemesis, Jezebel. Elisha, the surrounding Syrian army. Paul, the beast of Ephesus. Peter, the contrary winds. For the fear of people. David engineered Uriah's death. He feared losing his position. Samson divulged his secret to Delilah because of, her, because of his fear of losing her favors. And he was afraid of losing status in her eyes. Because of fear of the people, Peter, Peter denied vehemently that he had even known the Lord. Because of the fear of people, Governor Pilate relented and let the people crucify Jesus. No wonder the word of God said in Exodus uh, chapter 23 verse 3, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. God has not called you and me to do what is popular, but to do what is right. Fear the people. Well, I would do it, but I'm afraid of what the people might say. I would make this decision, but I just don't know how the people will take it. You know, it seems to me that we become more and more secular the closer we come to the coming of Jesus Christ. We become less and less concerned about what God says and about what God has already said and about what God directs us than we are about what the people might think. Is it right in the sight of the people rather than is it right in the sight of God? Forget about what the people say. If God said it, let's do it and he'll stand behind it every time. Fear the people. And then the second giant that they faced was the fear of failure. They wanted to succeed so badly that they were afraid to try. The only thing worse than a quitter is the fellow afraid to begin. Someone once asked gentleman Jim Corbett during his colorful boxing career, what's the most important thing for a person to do to become champion of the world? Gentleman Jim ought to know he just knocked out John L. Sullivan in the 24th round of their bare knuckles heavyweight championship match in the year 1892. Gentleman Jim said the most important thing for a person to do to become champion of the world is to fight one more round. When Walt Disney applied to the Kansas City Star for a job as an artist, the editor of the Star sent Disney away saying, young man, you have some talent, but it's my professional opinion. You just don't have the raw talent it takes to make it as a commercial cartoonist. 
First time George Gorsham played the piano in public, they laughed him off the stage, but he went one more round. It could be that I've come by Birmingham, Alabama to tell somebody tonight, it's always too soon to quit, so hang in there. God isn't dead. With God, all things are possible. For fear of failure, they never even tried. They accepted defeat without so much as a single shot being fired. They ran and whimpered and cowered and murmured and whined and complained in their tents against the Lord without ever thinking that God was able to do what he said he would do. Failure. How I hate failure. I hate it in myself. But yet I've got to be honest with you and tell you that I've learned a lot more from my failures than I have from the few successes that I've been able to achieve. Failure does things for me. Failure helps me to keep my grip loose on this world and my grip tight on the next world. Failure often irrigates my vision, washes away the gunk and the junk, helps me to see my real goal is to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I thank God for my failures. I don't want any more, but I thank God for them. We need to learn two or three things about failure. Number one, to fail does not mean that you yourself are a failure. The devil wants you to think that you're a failure just because you've failed. That fear of failure is an ominous, vicious, cruel giant. The fear of failure financially. Somebody here tonight may be hanging on by your fingernails, facing the humiliation, the embarrassment of bankruptcy, and that's probably the worst part about bankruptcy, is the embarrassment of it. And, 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 and it maybe seems that there's just no way out. And you're afraid of financial failure. Others may be afraid of failure in relationships. Others may fear failure in winning your family members to Jesus Christ. And others may be afraid of failing God and going back on God and missing the rapture. Others may be afraid of failing health, of, of a sore spot you may think is a malignant cancer. Or, or when you lie on your left side at night, your heart races or skips beat. And, and you're afraid that maybe you're, you have cardiac arrhythmia and maybe having heart trouble. And, and a lot of things concern people and, and keep them from doing and being what they ought to be. The devil has been telling some of you you that you're going to fail, that you're going to lose, that you're going down, that you're not going to make it, that you're not worth anything, that your family's going to hell, that you're going to hell, that you're going to miss the rapture, that your ministry's going to pot, that you're facing financial bankruptcy. I know what he's been telling you. I've heard his voice myself sometimes. I know what he's been saying to you because he's been saying some of the things, same things to me. He says you're going to lose. He says you cannot win. But I say through the faith of God tonight, you are not going to lose. You're going to win. I say through the faith of God, you're not going to be defeated. You are going to be victorious. I say through the faith of God tonight, you are not going under. You're going over. I say through the faith of God, you're not going to lose your family. You're going to win your family to Jesus Christ. I say you're not going to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. In the name of Jesus, you are going to win. Ooh, hallelujah. You are going to win. I know the devil doesn't like you to hear that, but I've come this far from Tampa, Florida today to tell you that you're not going to lose, you're going to win. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me hear a, a divine affirmation of faith. I don't know, you may not believe in this, but I believe in it. Scriptural, speaking to yourselves in psalms and songs and spiritual hymns, encouraging yourself, encouraging one another in the Lord. I speak tonight in affirmation. I point to myself and touch myself on the shoulder and I say, I'm going to win. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to win. Let me hear you do that. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to win. Say it again. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to win. Say it again. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to win.
somebody near you may need that word of encouragement more than you do. Why don't you turn to somebody and say to them, you're going to win. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I can do all things, all things, all things, all things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do it. I can do it. We can win in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. been telling some of you there'll be no word from the Lord. You can't have revival in your church anymore. You'll never receive the Holy Ghost. You'll never receive your healing. How long will it take us to understand that the devil is a liar? And he is the father of liars. Now take that devil. You are a liar. You are a liar. There will be a word from the Lord. There you will hear from heaven. You will have revival in your church. Say, so, well, we can't pay the bills now. By the faith of God, you shall know no lack. The word of God said in Philippians 4 19, doesn't take into account the Federal Reserve Board's manipulation of the interest rates. Does it take into account whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in? Does it take into account the price in the stock market, the price of gold, commodities, silver, the unemployment rate? It just says, my God shall supply. A-L-L, -L, all your need, all your need. Not some, not most, all, all. Say all, everybody. All. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus the Lord. So to fail does not mean that you are a failure. Second thing I want to say about failure is that failure need never be forever. Just because you failed once or twice or 62 or 136 or 466 times doesn't mean that it need to be forever. I toured uh, the home of Thomas Edison, the great American inventor, years ago. Elderly man was taking the tour and he spoke with such personal um, vitality about Thomas Edison. I sensed that maybe this older gentleman had known Mr. Edison, so I waited for the tour group to leave and and I engaged him in conversation. I said, you, you spoke with such, such personal insight. I got the feeling that you may, have, you may have known Thomas Edison. He said, oh, he said, I did. He said, I worked as his laboratory assistant when I was in school. Then I couldn't keep up with his pace, so I dropped out of school and learned more, taking notes and observing him than I ever could in school. I said, well, tell me what's... What's your greatest, the strongest memory you have of Thomas Edison? He said, well, he was a marathon worker. Time meant nothing to him. He'd work 21 hours in a row and then sleep for two hours, then wake up and work another 17 and a half hours and sleep four hours and then have a meal and work another 26 hours and then sleep six hours and wake up and work another 14 hours and so on. He said, it, was, it nearly wore me out. And he said, uh, he was seemingly right on the verge of a breakthrough regarding the incandescent light bulb of hardening the shell that surrounds the bulb so it wouldn't burst after a few minutes of heat. And uh, one day I was so exhausted, I came to Mr. Edison and I said, Sir, I said, how do you find the courage, how do you find the, the stamina to keep on? According to my calculations, you have failed in 2,162 experiments. 
He said, I didn't know what Tom Essendon was going to do, but he slung his spectacles off and he came at me across the room and he put his finger under my nose and he said, young man, I'll have you know that I have not failed 2,162 times. I have succeeded in finding 2,162 combinations that will not work. Now let's get back to work. And the man said, by actual count, 177 experiments later, Thomas Edison found the right combination that worked. I'm so glad that Tom Edison didn't quit trying because he had failed in the eyes of a young laboratory assist assistant 2,162 times. In the work of the Lord, what will we say to God when we face him and he'll say why didn't you do what I called you to do I called you to actually go into the harvest and reap the grain but Lord we were too busy having commission meetings and task forces and sharpening the weapons and writing our reports and presenting those reports and creating these nice things that look good on paper and he'll say but why didn't you actually get into the harvest and reap the grain while you had opportunity but Lord we were so busy doing your work in these meetings they seemed so important at the time it seemed to be the priority and God will say but why didn't you do it but Lord, I was afraid of failing. Surely somebody besides me could have done it. Who is going to do it if you and I don't do it? Who's going to win the souls if you and I don't win them? Who's going to open up new territories and new nations and new worlds for Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God if we don't do it? We have a whole eternity, an entire eternity to celebrate our victories. But only one short hour remains before the midnight cry. You remember that little nursery rhyme limerick of years ago? I believe that people see what they want to see and they do pretty well what they want to do. Remember it said, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? He said, I've been to London to see the Queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what saw you there? I chased a little mouse under the queen's chair. Here the pussycat was in Buckingham Palace. He had access to seeing the queen's jewels, the sapphires and rubies and diamonds, the elegance of Buckingham Palace itself, the lords and ladies of the queen's court. What he saw was a little mouse that he chased under the queen's chair. And the limerick goes on where he interviews a, a buzzard. And he says, where have you been? And the limerick goes that I've, uh, I've surmounted uh, majestic mountain peaks and the ocean's foams and the beaches. And what saw you there? He said, I saw a dead cow and the call, a jackal's call and maggots crawling inside. Sometimes we focus on the wrong things. We see the wrong things. We talk about the wrong things. We report the wrong things. Some people can go to a ripened harvest field and they see the, the shekels of grain everywhere ready to be reaped and they win souls. Somebody else can go to the same harvest field and say, well, these folks aren't Church of God. They don't look like Church of God. They don't act like Church of God. Of course they don't. They've been in communism. The Lord willing, we'll meet a young girl tomorrow night who was converted just a few months ago in our ministry in Russia, who was born into a communist family, who went to Moscow State University, and the first time she heard the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, she interpreted it. The Lord saved her soul and forgave her of her sins, and she's a Holy Ghost-filled Christian today, working full-time for God. Some people can go to China. They can see a vast harvest field and, and an unparalleled opportunity for the gospel. They hear the words of the prisoners and they hear the words of the house churches as they whisper for fear that the police will catch them and disband them and perhaps rob them as they do sometimes and send them to prison or kill them. They literally whisper the songs. Amazing grace. 
That's what they do. It's how they worship sometimes in the most uh, dire circumstances in house churches. Some people can go and they can weep and they can get moved by that and they see the harvest field and they say, we've got to team up with these people. We've got to network with them. Somebody else can go to say the same thing and say, those people are afraid of the authorities. Why don't they just open up and let go and let God have his way and clap their hands and shout and run the aisles like we do. Brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you is that God has a world out there that's dying and going to hell and we're fussing about who's going to play the piano on Sunday night. We're losing our sons and daughters and we're worried about who's going to teach the card class on Sunday morning. Teachers, are, Preachers and teachers are having heart attacks and pastors' wives are having nervous breakdowns because there is no such thing as commitment. There is no such thing as loyalty. There is no such thing as faithfulness. There is no such, things, uh, such thing anymore as doing the right thing because God's Word said it. But thank God for those men and women who are doing what they're doing because God's Word said it. I want to tell you, great will be your reward in heaven. You'll hear Him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in to the joys of your Lord. Lord. Somebody say amen here tonight. <clears throat> Somebody else say praise the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody shout glory to God. Raise your hands and say praise the Lord. Say glory to God. Say hallelujah. What I'm saying is, brother, let's see the right things. Let's do the right things. Let's say the right things. Let's believe the Lord's report. He said we're well able to do it, so let's do it when God says let's do it. Hallelujah. Not is it popular, but is it right? Not will the people agree with it, but will God approve it? Who are, why are we doing what we're doing? Who are we doing this for? Who's called us anyway? Why are we spending? Why are we giving? Why are we investing? Fear of failure. Should I change mics? We're not having a thunderstorm, are we? Okay. We hear a giant snoring. We're going to wake him up and kill him. third thing about failure. Refuse to allow the fear of failure to paralyze you. Do what you're going to do for God. God can only bless an effort. When no effort is made, God has nothing to bless. We've stopped even trying to think about having revival meetings anymore. When no effort is made, God has nothing to bless. Some of our brothers and sisters are hoping and making plans to abandon the Sunday night uh, worship revival rally service. Have a super Sunday morning service, abandon Sunday night, abandon Wednesday night, abandon prayer meetings, stay at home with your family nights. I call that a cop-out. I don't know what anybody else calls it. I just call it a cop-out. We just give up. You know, it's good, it's good to come to churches like this and to camp meetings like this and, and to hear messages and to hear singing and to hear messages in tongues and an interpretation of tongues and have people receive the Holy Ghost baptism and other people healed and others delivered and set free. But you know, I say with all due respect, where we really need to hear from heaven is in the local church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's where we really need to hear from heaven. And God, let it begin in every church in Alabama, I pray, from this camp meeting forward. That's where we really need it. Then the third and most disastrous giant that confronted them was the fear that God would not be with them as He had been with them in the past. The fear that God would not be with them as He had been with them in the past. I can quote this scripture, but I'd like for somebody up here to get Revelation 21 and 8 ready and come up to the microphone and read it. Somebody nearby, if you will, please. <clears throat> what I want to say to you is the fear that God will not be with you as He has been in the past is perhaps the most deadly giant of all. 
God has not gone out of the soul-saving business. He has not stopped healing people. He has not stopped baptizing people with the Holy Ghost. He has not stopped setting people free. He is still delivering people. He is still setting people free. He is still saving sinful souls. He's still writing new names in the Lamb's Book of Life. God has not abdicated His responsibility. God is still sovereign. He's still on the throne. But some of us have changed our perception of who God is. Somebody has that? Come on, Bill. Revelation 21 and 8. The little red one. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We're talking about some serious stuff there, aren't we, Bill? The fearful, the unbelieving, sorcerers, whoremongers, idolaters, workers of witchcraft, and all liars. Not some liars. Even Christian liars. Christian. If you're not going to do it, don't tell me you're going to do it. Just keep your mouth shut and do it and then surprise me. Liars. All liars. Liars by insinuation. His name comes up in a conversation. Well, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't have that opinion. You'd hit your knees and pray for that brother if you knew what I knew. Didn't say anything, but you insinuated against his character. Liars by innuendo. Nuances are very thin between those two, but... Liars by incompleteness. Half-truths. Liars by wrong inflection. In other words, anything that we consciously do to mislead the perceptions of others is a lie. I don't know why I'm preaching this way, but I just feel impressed with God to just come right down. Is that all right with you? Is that okay? And I'll just leave it between you and the Holy Spirit right there and move on. The fearful, the unbelieving, sorcerers, whoremongers, idolaters, and all liars. All liars. And the fearful and the unbelieving. The people were afraid to believe that God was able to do what he had done through them and for them in the past. And they chickened out. They lost their moral courage. They lost their daring. They lost their faith. And consequently, they lost their inheritance. It was not a, it was not a, it was not a light thing. God did not view it as a light thing for the people to, to doubt him and to not possess the land. When he said, we're well able to do it through his prophets Joshua and Caleb. We're well able to do it. Let's do it now. But they listened to the power of an evil report. They believed an evil report. They panicked at hearing an evil report. Well, we're being bombarded with these reports. What I want to know is what kind of bombers are they? Is it one or two B-52s or is 24 F-17s? You know, is a little puddle jumper with crop dusters. You know, what are you being bombarded with? We need men and women with moral courage who will say, we are going to do what God said to do. We're going to make a redemptive impact on this world, whether you like it or not, whether it's popular or not, whether it's on your turf or your territory or not. We're going to believe the Lord's report. Who has believed the report of the Lord? We shall believe the report of the Lord. You know what? 
the only two. And these ten spies that brought back the negative report, they deserve for their names to be on the scrap heap of anonymity in history. For none of us here to even remember their names or even want to remember their names. But none of us here will ever forget the names of Joshua and Caleb. Because they said, we can do it. We can possess it. We can win. We will overcome. We will prevail. God will help us. God is able. Let's go. You know what? The wrath of the Lord was kindled against those people. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against them. Not a single one of them. Not one single one that believed the negative report ever saw the promised land. They died in the wilderness. Deprived of their rightful inheritance that they could have possessed 40 years, 60 years, 70 years sooner. But they ambled around in the wilderness for all those years because they believed and they acted upon a negative report. How different it would have been had they believed the report of the Lord. But they believed that the sons of Anak, the giants, were greater than the people of God. They believed themselves to be grasshoppers and thought that the people of Anak perceived them as grasshoppers. But those straw men that have loomed so large in your life for so many years can come tumbling down in the next few moments of time. Stay with me just a moment. Spiritually, I'm going to ask you to do a very difficult thing for some of you. I'm going to ask you to get a pencil or a pen and a little slip of paper. The Word of God said judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And so it does. Judgment does begin <coughs> in the house of the Lord. Pencil and paper, quickly, please. If you don't have a pencil, borrow one. This won't take you very long, and it's going to be done confidentially and quickly. But yet with deep heart searching. I want you to quickly, I want you to quickly and confidentially write down the one or two giants that loom larger in your life than any other. If it's money, just put a dollar sign. If you don't want somebody to see it, then put X or Z, the algebraic term. Whatever it is that's been hindering you, whatever the giant is, whatever it is, if it's fear of people or fear of failure, may even seem to be a virtue. You may have rationalized it as some sort of a virtue. But deep down inside, you know it's a giant that's, that's terrorized you for years and terrifying you even now as I speak. But I believe I've heard from heaven this afternoon that God is going to set you free. You are going to be delivered from that fear. You are going to be delivered from that secret sin. You want to be delivered from that fear of failure, that fear from people, or that fear that God will abandon you, that God will not be with you. I want to tell you that he said... In Psalms 27, your father, your mother may forsake you, but I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And in Matthew, he said, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. God has not forgotten you. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows the giants that loom large in the shadows of your life. He knows you. And he's the warrior. He's the mighty warrior. The Holy Ghost was not given as a nursing mother to fretful children, but he was given as the captain of a mighty host. Tonight we're going to call upon our captain to, in Jesus' name, help us slay the giants. Put it down on paper. Then as soon as you put it down, if you will fold it up <clears throat> to the smallest portion of paper that you can. If you don't have a pencil, then let the paper, let the piece of paper that's blank symbolize the one thing in your life, the one giant of the two giants. 
that have loomed so large in your life for so long. <clears throat> fold it up as small as you can and then fold it over again and maybe even look like a paper wad. Have you got it in your hand? Have you got it ready? Search your heart, saith the Lord. Wash you and be made clean. Put away the evil of your doings before mine eyes. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Look unto me, and I, the Lord, will save you. I, the Lord, will deliver you. I, the Lord, will set you free. Thank you, Jesus. We claim that promise tonight in Jesus' name. And I'm going to ask you to hold that little piece of paper up in your hand right now. <clears throat> Just do it right now. Do it. Thank you. All the way up in the balcony. Hold it in your hand. Lord, on this slip of paper or symbolized by this slip of paper, there are giants. Giants within. Giants inside of us. The fear of people, the fear of failure, the fear that you won't be with us in the futures you have been in the past. Lord God, forgive us for ever thinking that thought. Forgive us for ever buying that lie of the devil. We know that we're not going to be defeated, we're going to be victorious. We know that we're not going to lose, we know that we're going to win. Oh Lord, help us to meet and defeat the giants within tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus. Are you ready to commit it to the Lord right now? If you are, stand up. Stand up with that paper in your hand. Stand up. Are you ready to commit it to the Lord? Stand up if you are, all over the building. And if you're not involved in this, stand up now. Everybody here, nobody heading for the exits. Everybody staying absolutely still. Holding your hand up. The Word of God said, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you casting all your care upon him for he he loves you with an everlasting love he wants to set you free he wants to deliver you tonight i'm going to ask you to pray the prayer i'm going to ask walter atkinson to come out here and pray a prayer of deliverance and i want you to yes lord what the man of god says i want you to give verbal assent and verbal approval and amens and hallelujahs to what he says then after he says amen to the prayer he's going to hand the microphone back to me we're going to take the next step pastor atkinson come and pray the deliverance prayer with us tonight Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of your benefits. Who forgives all of my iniquities. Who heals all of my diseases. Who redeems my life from destruction and crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed as the eagles. He has heard the cry of my oppression and delivered me. He's cast my transgressions from me as far as the east is from the west. And he knows I'm human, I'm frail, and yet he pities me as a father pities his child. Thank you, God, for loving us and caring for us and delivering us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we believe you and we accept your help and your deliverance and amen. Right now, I'm going to lead you in an exercise of faith. Come on out here with me, Brother Atkinson, if you will. Right now, I'm going to ask you to pray the answer. Don't anybody pray the problem. Everybody here, begin to pray the answer. Would you just do that right now, Lord? Hallelujah. I thank you for conquering the, ti the giants. Just right now, just begin to praise him. Exercise your faith. Go ahead. Begin to exercise your faith. You're going to make it. God's going to deliver you. You're going to be set free tonight in the next few minutes. Begin to exercise your faith. Father God, I thank you. I praise you. I honor you. I glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your wonderful name, Lord. Praise your wonderful name, Lord. Praise your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. I meet the giants within, and I come against every giant tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
Satan, you have fabricated straw men. You have set up spiritual giants to terrorize God's people. I command you to take your hands off of God's property. Devil, back off. In the name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, back off. Take your hands off God's people in the name of Jesus. Take your hands off of God's people now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. All right, are you ready to do something? It's going to be probably the strangest thing any preacher's ever asked you to do. These pieces of paper that you've got that symbolize the one giant that's there, I'm going to say in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, be set free. When I say free, I not only want you to release it, I want you to cast it. Cast it up like confetti, like a celebration. The janitor here at Cathedral of the Cross is going to love Carl Richardson. We may ought to form a committee of action. Don't anybody go around after church looking at what other people's giants were. Let's burn them up in the, in the uh, garbage disposal tonight after church or tomorrow morning. Tonight, I don't want anybody here to take the giant home with you. I want us to cast the cares upon him. Whatever it is who's him worrying you, whatever the fear, whatever the anxiety, whatever the apprehension, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, be set free. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now clap your hands for God's glory. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Clap your hands for God's glory. Hallelujah. Who has believed the report of the Lord? Well, who report will you believe? The report of the Lord. Tell me whose report are you going to believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord.